If you're looking for a perfect gift for the music lover or podcast lover in your life, just in time for both Mother's and Father's Day, stick around to the end of the show because I've got a 65% off product code just for you. Does the QB make the system, or does the system make the QB? When it comes to the Mike Leach air raid and all of the various offshoots that have spawned from it, it might be a little bit of both. When I first started digging into the new Arizona Cardinals coaching staff to try to better understand their needs in the upcoming draft, I set out to answer two questions first and foremost. One, how does Cliff Kingsbury's version of the air raid work? And two, between Josh Rosen and Kyler Murray, who is the better fit for this new system in 2019? And while looking into those questions, I ended up at an answer that I honestly never even expected. They both fit equally. They've got different backgrounds, different heights, and wildly different athletic traits, but in terms of who I would think would be the most productive passer in this system, truth be told, I don't think there would be much of a difference between their numbers at all. And believe me, I'll explain my reasoning for that later on the show, but before we can get into Murray or Rosen or the Air Raid system's inner workings, we can't go any further on any of those things without first giving some background on Kingsbury himself, all of his mentors and influences, and all the quarterbacks, both good and bad, that have come out of this system in recent years. For starters, let's back everything up to the late 80s and 90s, when Kingsbury's biggest influences, Mike Leach and Dana Holgerson, both worked under Hal Mummy at Iowa Wesleyan, Valdosta State, and then Kentucky up until 1998. Holgerson in particular started as a player underneath Leach and Mummy at Iowa Wesleyan before joining their staff as a young coach at Valdosta, which kickstarted his career, and while they were all together at Kentucky on the same staff, they coached a young wide receiver named Neil Brown, who you may recognize as the new head coach of West Virginia for 2019. After his playing days were over, Brown worked his way up in coaching with his own modified version of the Leach Air Raid at Troy, Texas Tech, Kentucky again, and then finally West Virginia where he took over as the replacement for, ironically enough, Dana Holgerson. Back to Mike Leach now though, because after he left Kentucky in the late 90s, he spent a year as the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach underneath Bob Stoops at Oklahoma before getting the job as Texas Tech's head coach in 2000. He was there until 2009, and as we all know, in that time he had multiple young quarterbacks on his teams that have now gone on to be successful coaches themselves, which brings us again to Cliff Kingsbury. In the early 2000s, Kingsbury was a three-year starter at QB in Leach's system before he eventually became a coach, and he started out his career at the University of Houston underneath, you guessed it, Dana Holgerson, who was the offensive coordinator for Kevin Sumlin at the time. Coincidentally, Sumlin also coached under Bob Stoops at OU in the mid-2000s, but he was never really a pure air raid offensive play caller like a lot of the other names on this list. Holgerson, however, was an air raid purist through and through, even while on Sumlin's staff, and Kingsbury followed in his footsteps as they designed a record-shattering passing attack for their star QB at the time, Case Keenum. Kingsbury and Holgerson then split up for different jobs a couple years later, with Kingsbury following Sumlin to Texas A&M, where he was the architect of Johnny Menzel's Heisman season, while Holgerson went to Oklahoma State in what became Brandon Whedon's first full year as a starter in Stillwater. Whedon went on to put up a ton of yards, and the Cowboys went 11-2 in Holgerson's lone season as play caller, including a blowout win over Arizona in the Alamo Bowl. Both of them were riding a spectacular wave of success by this point with their future first round picks at quarterback, but they were only just getting started as Dana landed a job as West Virginia's head coach in 2011, while Kingsbury took over as the head coach at Texas Tech in 2013. Holgerson's quarterbacks, like Geno Smith and most recently Will Greer, put up ridiculous numbers year in and year out, as you might expect. But Kingsbury's quarterback productivity was even more insane throughout his entire time in Lubbock as well. And speaking of those Kingsbury quarterbacks, let's go through some of those names because I feel like some people out there don't understand how much of an influence this system has had on the NFL's quarterback population. In Cliff's first year at TTU, he was dealing with a battle between two ultra-productive true freshmen named Baker Mayfield and Davis Webb, who you should obviously both recognize, with that battle ultimately ending in a disgruntled Mayfield transferring to Oklahoma as a walk-on. Webb stayed at Texas Tech, but he was hurt the next year and lost his job to yet another true freshman who exceeded all expectations, Patrick Mahomes. Mahomes never lost that job again, and he held onto the starter spot for the next three years, while Webb transferred to Cal to play for Sonny Dykes, who, surprise surprise, 
also coached under Mike Leach at Texas Tech in the early 2000s, and at Cal he ran a very similar system which was playfully dubbed the Bear Raid. Oh, and by the way, the guy that Webb replaced at Cal that season was Jared Goff, who left the previous year and became the first overall pick to the Rams. Let's back it up again though, because believe it or not, this does go deeper. While Dykes, Holgerson, and Leach were all coaching at Tech together, there were a couple more names that you might recognize on that sideline. Their running backs coach at the time was Art Bryles, who then went on to be the head coach at Houston a few years later, where he coached Kevin Cobb and then Case Keenum before he left for the Baylor job. Then at Baylor, his system turned RG3 into a second overall draft pick to Washington. Now, it is notable that Bryles' version of the system was much different than the rest of these guys because he never really had the same complexity in his passing game, instead opting to focus more on the option run game and package passing plays, but still, his presence on that Texas Tech staff should be noted because he had a huge influence on how they structured their run game. But even more notable than Bryles, little did we know, was a third string quarterback named Lincoln Riley, who at the time was stuck on the bench behind Kingsbury and BJ Simmons. After his playing days were over, Riley started coaching under Leach at Texas Tech from 2003 until 2009, before he eventually went to East Carolina and then finally to Oklahoma to be the offensive coordinator and heir apparent to, yet again, Bob Stoops. Riley is still at OU to this day, and in the last two years he has been the driving force behind back-to-back -back Heisman campaigns for Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray. So when it's all said and done, when you look at the complete resume of this Mike Leach coaching tree, this is a short list of some of the quarterbacks and some of the coaches that have come out of this system in the last 20 years. And this isn't even everyone, mind you, these are just the biggest names. Patrick Mahomes, Baker Mayfield, Jared Goff, Case Keenum, Robert Griffin III, Brandon Whedon, Johnny Manziel, Tim Couch, Kevin Cobb, Davis Webb, Geno Smith, Luke Falk, Cliff Kingsbury, Lincoln Riley, Graham Harrell, Neil Brown, Dana Holgerson, Sonny Dykes, and now both Kyler Murray and Will Greer. Not all of those names ended up working out in the NFL, obviously, and I'm not claiming that they did, but you've got at least eight first round quarterbacks in that group and potentially as many as five names that will end up being top two overall picks, depending on where Murray ends up being drafted. You've got four Heisman winners on that list, two rookies of the year, three pro bowlers, a first team all pro and NFL MVP award winner, and at least six head coaches with more probably on the way. That is an absolutely bonkers tree of talent that Mike Leach has built over the years. And what's most impressive to me is that when you look at all of those names, they're all very, very different from one another, and yet they were all still very productive as passers. Not all of them were big, not all of them had strong arms, and not all of them were mobile and could run around, but the system is so flexible and so friendly to quarterbacks of all shapes and sizes that as long as they aren't completely terrible passers, this offense is going to put up some serious yardage no matter what. It just so happens to be that whenever Leach or Kingsbury or Riley get their hands on a quarterback that is extremely talented, the system really takes off to a whole new level. So now with all of that extensive background out of the way, let's dive into what makes this offense special in the first place, flexibility and aggressiveness. Not every branch of the Mike Leach coaching tree is this way, but with Leach, Kingsbury, and Riley in particular, their passing games are all extremely adaptable and rely on their quarterbacks and receivers being highly cerebral players. A lot of their routes can be tagged to different routes based on coverages that are shown pre-snap, the quarterback has the power to change and adjust plays at the line of scrimmage, and even after the snap, a lot of routes will change in the middle of the play just based on the leverages and techniques that DBs are playing. It's one thing just to look at an offense that's labeled as an air raid and say that the system is simplistic or that the production is artificial or manufactured, but trust me, at least under those three coaches, Leach, Kingsbury, and Riley, there's a hell of a lot going on that some people may not realize. Let's take the mesh play as an example, which is one of the staple concepts of the Leach system, which he and Hal Mummy ironically stole from BYU decades ago and then passed down to all of their assistants over the years. And in this version of the mesh, this one play call can be adjusted and executed in five or six different ways depending on what the coverage is before and after the snap. So flexibility and quick decision making are critical. As Leach himself said in a coaching clinic several years ago, if you don't have a quarterback that can take a mental snapshot of the entire defense and read multiple routes that are simultaneously changing on the fly, you're going to have a tough time running this play to its full potential because it's a lot more demanding than you think. And quarterbacks have a love-hate uh, relationship with this play. They love the completions. They love that that bails them out of a lot of stuff. But what they don't like is there's a lot of commotion in front of them, and there's a certain amount of uncertainty with it. And so 
the best ones are the guys that can snapshot the field and say, okay, more space here than here, so I'm throwing it here. Okay, corner out here, corner out here. You know, if they can't do that, uh, I've never had success, uh, very good success fighting City Hall on that. As I was preparing to write this episode, I watched a lot of Washington State, Texas Tech, and Oklahoma offensive performances, even going back to the epic 2016 showdown between the duos of Kingsbury and Mahomes versus Riley and Mayfield, and even both Texas Tech and Oklahoma ran this same concept against each other within the first two minutes of the first quarter. To say that this one play is a cornerstone of the whole offense might be an understatement to me, because its flexibility and reliability are what define the entire system in the first place. To explain how it all really works, let's use an example from Oklahoma with Kyler Murray last season, since he is of course the main thing on the mind of every Cardinals fan these days. This is against Texas in the Big 12 championship game, and it's third and five in a tie game in the fourth quarter. This is a gotta have it down for OU, and in these gotta have it situations, Lincoln Riley is often gonna go back to his roots and call his old reliable mesh out of a three by one set. Texas isn't just gonna give it to them for free though, because they've already seen this play enough over the last few years to know that it's coming. You can see this boundary corner squatting on the out route in man coverage, which is typically the first read in the progression, and he's not gonna give enough space for that to be an automatic throw. So based on the progression, since the out is taken away, Kyler now moves on to the mesh itself. He's reading both of these crossing routes at the same time, and his receivers are doing a good job of keeping those routes nice and tight together to create the most disruption possible within the defense. They even give each other a high five as they cross, just to make sure that their spacing is good. Now, the key to a successful mesh play against man coverage is to create separation by forcing this trailing corner to break away from his path and go over the top of his teammate, which gives Kyler's intended receiver just enough space to catch this ball in stride and turn up field to move the chains. You've heard this called a rub or a pick before, and these kinds of rubs are why the mesh gains so much popularity in the first place among coaches from all different kinds of systems. This play absolutely kills man coverage if it is done right. And obviously in this instance, these OU receivers did it right and kept their spacing nice and close. But all of this does beg the question. If one of the main pillars of the air raid offense is a simple mesh concept to tear up man coverage, what's stopping defenses from just running something like cover two zone to sit on those crossing routes and take them away? Look no further than later in that exact same quarter where Texas tried just that on another third and long situation to beat that mesh. They knew that it was coming on another gotta have it down because that's just what Lincoln Riley does, and so they called the one coverage that they hoped would be able to stop it because they would no longer have to be trailing these receivers and forcing their own guys to run into each other. But again, like all passing plays in the Leach slash Kingsbury slash Riley system, they've got an answer for everything. After the snap, again, the boundary corner is squatting on the number one receiver outside, so that's not there, and now Kyler is once again reading the mesh receivers over the middle. Those same receivers, however, are also reading the defense themselves as well, because like I said earlier, if they see that it's not man coverage, their routes are going to change in the middle of the play. So if you pay attention, you can see Lee Morris reading that there is no DB following the other mesh receiver here. So as far as he can tell, this is a zone defense and the linebackers are now responsible for handling this mesh over the middle, not the corners. As he processes that read, watch how Morris reacts and changes his route on the fly based on what he's seeing. He slows down and sidesteps to kind of angle himself into the path of the linebacker, Gary Johnson, and then once Johnson takes off to pick up that first meshing receiver, Morris gets sneaky and slips in behind him to the soft spot between zones so that he can move the chains. Kyler obviously does a great job avoiding the pressure and making a good throw in a muddy pocket to convert that first down, but really the stars of the show for me here are the play design and the flexibility that these players have to read and react to what they're seeing in real time. This was the exact same play call from Riley that we saw before against man coverage, but because Texas gave a different defensive look, both the receivers and the quarterback had to execute it totally differently, and that's what I love about this system. It's malleable, it's adaptable, and within a fraction of a second, a bad play call can become a good play call as long as your players are smart enough and disciplined enough to make the right reads. A lot of people look at the words air raid and think it's some sort of dumbed down, bastardized version of football that would never work in the NFL. And believe me, I used to be one of those people too. But the more I dig into this scheme, the more I realize that the Patriots and certain West Coast system coaches have been doing this for years and they've dominated the league because of it. 
all the option routes, all the pre-snap tags, all the site adjust to change routes based on coverage. I mean, these are concepts that have been around now for a long time in the Earhart Perkins system in New England and the new age Shanahan offenses in Washington, Atlanta, San Francisco, and LA. Hell, even Andy Reid adapted his West Coast system around Kingsbury's offense for Pat Mahomes, and it turned him into an NFL MVP in just one year. The more I watched these OU and Texas Tech games, the more I recognized all of these concepts that I just saw the Chiefs, Rams, and 49ers running last season. It's the same stuff. And now with the arrival of Kingsbury in the league, this whole movement, in my opinion, is going to get cranked up even more. To me, despite all of the advancement of the air raid throughout the NFL over the last decade or so, I think the main thing that the next wave of Mike Leach disciples are going to influence the league on, including Kingsbury of course, is how they can turn almost any play into an opportunity to go deep. When I watched TTU and Oklahoma tape over the past two weeks, I was blown away by how few f**ks they gave about defensive alignment. It didn't matter if it was cover one or cover three zone on the back end, if they wanted to go deep, they were going to adjust the play at the line of scrimmage in whatever way they had to to go deep, and there was nothing you could do to stop it. Like, we thought that the Chiefs were aggressive last year, but Cliff Kingsbury and Lincoln Riley make Andy Reid look conservative by comparison. My favorite part about studying these play designs was seeing how they would force defenses into one-on-one -on -one matchups down the field, even if it was zone coverage, and how they would just take advantage of those forced, isolated matchups with absolutely no fear. To them, every coverage was man coverage, even if it wasn't. I'll show you an example, again going back to that Texas game, and this was a 28-yard touchdown pass from Kyler Murray to C.D. Lamb that really could not possibly be thrown any better by Murray. Texas is in cover four here, which is probably the coverage they run more than anything else, while Oklahoma is essentially running a two-man route combination deep down the field off a play-action fake. They've got a fade to the far pylon for Marquise Brown, and he does a good job stemming his route inside to make sure that he's got room to run the fade in the first place, and then on the other side, they've got Lamb in the slot running a deep post. Now, if you've been on this channel long enough, you've seen me break down cover four responsibilities before, but if you're new here, the short version is that in quarters coverage, the slot receiver is going to be covered by the safety on any route further than 10 to 12 yards past the line of scrimmage. It doesn't matter if he breaks left or right, the safety is supposed to follow him on anything deep because he may or may not get help depending on if the other DBs around him also have to pick up something in their own deep zones. And Lincoln Riley knows that. He knows that even though it is technically a zone coverage call, they can isolate this safety against Lamb on the post and force them into essentially a man-to-man -man matchup anyway. If you occupy and take away their help, zone defenders become man defenders real damn quick, and I'll take a receiver like CD Lamb and man coverage against a safety any day of the week. So here's how Riley and Murray design and execute this play to get a man coverage look against a zone coverage call. After the play fake, this safety in the middle of the field, Caden Stearns, is moving away from the post and towards the open side of the field. And he's doing this because, to be honest, he has to. First, he needs to be in that spot in case this tight end wheels up into the open seam, so he's got to make sure that doesn't happen. And second, he needs to be there to give Brackett help inside to this boundary corner in case Brown also stems himself inside to the post as well. So we're two seconds into this play, and this bracket safety already has a full plate against two potential receivers. He cannot help this other safety, Brandon Jones, against Lamb, even if he wanted to. So again, with his inside help occupied elsewhere, that means that Jones is essentially in man coverage, even though it's a zone coverage call. And you can kind of see that Jones recognizes that he might not be getting any help even before the ball is snapped because he's set up with really heavy inside leverage against Lamb to help him not get beat inside on that post route in the first place. All the way through this route, he's staying inside and over the top of Lamb specifically to stop this one route because he knows that it might be coming. But again, it's a safety man-to-man -man against an all-conference receiver who might be a first-round pick next year. Leverage or no leverage, that's a really shitty matchup for Texas. And no matter what, they're gonna be at a disadvantage. Now, as Lamb is starting to roll inside to the post and Kyler is surveying that one-on-one -on -one down the field, take another look at Caleb Stearns again because he's definitely doing his part to make this play as difficult as possible for OU. He's recognizing really early that Murray wanted that post the whole time, so he's starting to haul ass to get back there and bracket Lamb inside to take it away. If Murray drills this ball just inside the hash where you would normally throw a post, there's actually a fairly decent chance that Stearns might be able to get there and make a play on it because he reacted so quickly. So this isn't as safe a throw as maybe Riley and Murray originally drew it up to be. 
It's at this exact moment that Kyler has to make a split-second decision based on the position of these two safeties and his receiver downfield. Either he trusts his arm and fires a missile straight to Lamb at the front of the goal line like this play was drawn up, or he gets a little creative and tries to find another window that might not be quite as obvious. The choice that Kyler ends up making on this throw to me represents everything that Mike Leach was talking about earlier in his ideal quarterback. When a lot is going on over the middle, a QB needs to be able to see the forest through the trees and find space where others might not. And that's precisely what Murray does when he releases this pass. He doesn't put the ball on a line and straight to the middle of the field in an impossibly tight window. He makes it easier on himself and puts it over the top and past Stearns' angle in a second window that only Lamb can get to. By the time Stearns reads where the ball is going, he can't turn around quick enough and reset himself and Lamb is already in a dead sprint going past him. The only person who could physically get to that ball and bring it in was Lamb. And to me, this read, this accuracy, this route, and this split decision making, all of it is what defines the controlled aggression of the air raid system. This throw right here is the air raid. I mean, hell, this was a zone defense, quarters coverage, and they're running two receivers down the field like it's a shot play against man. The isolated backside safety was lined up way inside to stop this exact route. The bracket safety knew it was coming too, and he bailed to get back there and help the moment he read the play. This should not have worked, and most quarterbacks would not have even attempted that pass because it's a really low percentage throw. But in this system, you're trained how to turn those low percentage throws into high percentage throws. You're taught how to find matchups, how to find space, and how to see the forest through the trees. For years, we've all thought that the air raid would never work in the NFL, or at least not in its true form under a coach like Kingsbury who isn't afraid to call passes 85% of the time. But the truth is, if you got a quarterback that can handle the mental and physical load that this system puts on them, you can absolutely make this work in the pros. We've already seen a whole bunch of teams have success by adopting half of the system, so we might as well see what happens when Arizona's crazy enough to go all in, right? As bad as the Cardinals offense was last year, even they managed to find ways to isolate safeties in zone coverage every now and then so that Josh Rosen could exploit those matchups. Just imagine if he was in an offense that cut the leash and let him make those kinds of throws all the time. Josh is an aggressive quarterback and he gets better the more he's allowed to push the ball down the field. And even though it didn't happen often, there were enough wow plays from Rosen in really tight windows that make me think he could not only survive in Kingsbury's offense, but thrive in it. When I look at Arizona's quarterback debate as it relates to their new head coach, it really only comes down to two distinct questions. First, can Kyler Murray run this passing game to its maximum potential within three years? In my opinion, yes, he can. Second, can Josh Rosen also run this passing game to its maximum potential within three years? And yes, I believe he can too. Kyler obviously comes with the element of mobility that Rosen doesn't have, and we know that Cliff has used that to his advantage in the past when he had Mahomes, but while Murray's traits allow Kingsbury to expand the playbook a little bit, the air raid isn't really built around a quarterback being mobile, or at least this version of it isn't, so I kinda don't care about that. Just running the system smoothly as a passer is good enough for me. So really, despite my best effort to answer the Rosen versus Murray question over the last two weeks, in the end, I really only discovered that the question itself doesn't matter. Regardless of who is taking snaps for this team next season, the offense is going to be very much improved because they both fit just fine. As they keep adding talent up front, and as they keep adding speed to their receiving core to help whoever their quarterback is, it's only going to get better from there. Honestly, I can't wait to see what it looks like in two years, because once this roster does get a line that can actually block, and some receivers that can actually run, they're going to be hands down one of the league's most entertaining offenses. The NFL has been progressively dipping more and more toes into the air raid waters over the last 20 years, and the results have gotten better and better with each passing season. But what the Cardinals are doing right now is well past the point of dipping toes in the water. With the hiring of Cliff Kingsbury, they're jumping headfirst into the deep end and fully embracing the movement with everything they've got. I don't know exactly what will happen next, or who will be Arizona's quarterback of the future, but I can at least say one thing with some semblance of confidence. Regardless of what they decide to do in two weeks, whether they choose Kyler or Josh, don't worry about it. Honestly, this whole debate never really mattered anyway.
thank you so much for watching this week's episode. And I also want to thank my sponsor, Cove, for helping to make this episode possible. A little while back, they sent me this fantastic Bluetooth speaker, which I've been using for about a month now, multiple times a week. And at the time they said, Brett, we're trying to gain some ground in the Bluetooth speaker market. We've got a product we believe in and we want people to give us a chance. Will you try us out? So I said, hell yeah, give me a speaker because I didn't already have one and my dad does and I've always been super jealous of it. And holy crap, I was not ready for how loud this thing is across the house. I mean, it really booms. The bass and sound quality is fantastic. Its interface was really easy for me to use. It connects to my phone and my laptop or my tablet. It lasts almost all day on one charge and its range is pretty good too. I mean, I've been like two rooms away without any lost signal whatsoever. So just all around, I've not had any complaints at all yet. The original price for the normal speaker is 200 bucks, but again, because Cove is just giving out huge discounts, you can use my promo code BRETT65 to get 65% off your purchase if you buy the Cove commuter speaker. That brings the price all the way down to 70 bucks, so it's very affordable for the quality that you get. You can either buy it for yourself to use around the house, or it also makes for a great gift for Mother's or Father's Day too. I've really enjoyed mine both in the kitchen and at the beach, and I think you're gonna like it as well. So if you're interested in it, head to the link in the description below. You can check it out there. And if you decide you wanna buy it, use that promo code BRETT65 for that big fat ass discount. As for me, I'll be back in, uh, I guess a little under two weeks from now with my third annual mock draft special. It's gonna be probably gigantic as usual, but if you want an early idea of maybe which players I'm high on and which ones I'm not, I'll be putting up my first combined position big board this weekend on my Patreon exclusively for all patrons. I've already got my individual position rankings up there, but this will be my first combined big board. So keep an eye out for that, as well as probably another Q&A session either right before or right after the draft or both. If I can do both, I'll, I'll just do that. But we'll see what I have time to do while I'm working on that mock. But uh, yeah, anyway, I'll see you guys in a couple weeks. And until then, later.